basic echo session for April. I want to apologize that last month, uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, we didn't have a session, but we still hope to pick up the topic when the facilitators are ready. Um, I'm glad that we have with us some very, very uh, erudite presenters. Uh, we'll get to introduce ourselves when we talk. And I think I just want to talk about the housekeeping. Um, we should make sure we name our, our phone. We are using our phone or our computer so that it's easier. And then we mute ourselves when we're not talking and unmute when we're ready to talk. We will quickly just run through the agenda for the day. Um, the topic, uh, the overarching topic is IPC. Uh, program, setting up an IPC program. Uh, we think that is uh, very, very important for this target audience. And the first uh, presenter will take us from 2 to 2.30, improving the IPC landscape. Our erudite uh, scholar, Professor Samuel Ilobo, who is right here beside me. And then quickly we'll go on to the practical hands-on side of it by Dr. John FJB uh, at the service delivery level to share her experience, how to do it. And then we have a case presentation, a spotlight session. Uh, improvement in the IPC practices at the Lifeline Hospital Suhileri by Dr. Iyabo Kudaya. We we'll have discussions from 3 to 3.20, get our feedbacks from 3.20 for about five minutes, and then we announce the next session. That is a big uh, overview of what we have to do today. Um, and I want us to just quickly go through and start uh, the presentation. Um, our first speaker is none other than our professor of clinical microbiologist in the College of Medicine Ambrose Ali University, as well as being a consultant clinical microbiologist and infection disease specialist at Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, uh, both in Edo State. He's right here. He's uh, very vast. He's been uh, with uh, night night with Nika. But Nika is not one Nika. He's now NC Nigeria Society for Infection Control. Uh, he's a member of so many professional bodies. He's an external examiner to many university teaching hospitals. He's actually here examining the clinical microbiologist. We have to tear him away. And he's here to just give us this big overview. Like I said, he's a distinguished everyday scholar. And I think we are most privileged to have him here with us to give us this view on improving the infection control, infection prevention and control landscape. Over to you, my boss. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my president, uh, it's my pleasure to be at this echo session, and it's a rare privilege and uh, a honor, which I'm not taking for granted. So this afternoon, I shall be uh, talking on improving the infection prevention and control landscape. So I'll go through the following outline. Um, definition of infection prevention and control, the goals of uh, IPC, core components of IPC, organizational structure of IPC, the activities of infection prevention and control, and then the approach to improving the IPC landscape. So the WHO definition of infection prevention and control is a scientific approach with practical solutions designed to prevent harm caused by infections to patients and healthcare workers grounded in principles of infectious disease, 
epidemiology, social science, and health system strengthening, and rooted in patient safety and health service quality. So it says it's a set of policies, guidelines, and practices performed in healthcare settings to prevent or minimize the spread of pathogens. And some of the principles are applicable in community settings to serve, to protect patients, health workers, and the community. Create awareness of pathogens and their impact on healthcare workers, patients, and the environment. To provide means of breaking the cycle of infectious diseases, it is cost-effective healthcare practice and intervention. It ensures the best possible standard of care. Reported hospital-specific healthcare uh, associated infection rates have been widely utilized to monitor hospital quality of care. So IPC is meant to reduce healthcare associated infection rates. Going through the historical milestones of uh, infection prevention and control, it started with a physician in 1847, and in 1863, a nurse joined Later in 1980, we have many nurses, and then today, infection prevention and control is everybody's business. What are the goals of infection prevention uh, control program? It says to protect yourself, protect your community, protect your patients. And the core components, there are eight core components of uh, um, IPC, number one is infection prevention and control program. At the facility level, there should be an infection control and prevention, uh, infection prevention and control program to, uh, to uh, identify the incidence and prevalence rates of uh, 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 healthcare associated infections, antimicrobial resistance, and uh, it sets objective to ensure that this healthcare associated infection and AML are contained. So uh, the second uh, core component is uh, IPC guidelines. Then we have infection prevention control, education training and evaluation. At every facility, there should be uh, education of health workers, training and retraining of health workers. And uh, in the standard uh, facility, there are IPC experts to train all the health workers and even non-clinical uh, health workers like the administrative staff. Then the fourth uh, goal is surveillance of healthcare associated infection. This is the backbone of infection control program. And in carrying out uh, surveillance, there should be a solid uh, medical microbiology laboratory support to uh, identify uh, the healthcare associated infections and the uh, antimicrobial resistance. Then the fifth uh, goal is the multimodal strategies for implementing IPC activities. And it is uh, meant to cause cultural change, behavioral change towards uh, IPC uh, using the role models or champions for effective quality. And it uses the, quality, uh, the principle of build it, teach it, Check it, sell it, and leave it. The sixth uh, goal is monitoring, evaluation, and feedback using the audit and feedback to influence the behavioral uh, behavior, uh, change. While the seventh goal is workload staffing and bed occupancy at facility level 
The aim goal is uh, built environment, materials, and equipment for IPC at facility level. So um, at every facility, the structural organo organogram, at the top we have uh, the hospital management headed by the chief medical director, and then followed by the infection prevention and control committee. This is a multidisciplinary committee that formulates policy for infection prevention and control. With the subcommittee, uh, the infection prevention and control team, comprising of the infection control officer, infection control nurse. Uh, so they work at the world level to do the day-to-day -day surveillance in case there's going to be an outbreak, it can be neat in the world. So these are the activities of uh, IPC. Uh, standard precautions, additional based, uh, additional transmission-based precautions, surveillance and epidemiology, clinical laboratory safety, occupational safety, and employee health, with or without the antimicrobial stewardship. The antimicrobial stewardship can be a standalone uh, program in some facilities, but it can also be part of the infection uh, prevention and control uh, committee activities. So uh, I will dwell briefly on the standard precaution because of our time. The golden rule is that uh, any patient should be uh, assumed to be infectious. And so healthcare workers should take care of, uh, to protect themselves by implementing standard uh, precautions, whether the patient is showing symptoms or not. The healthcare workers should uh, protect themselves and the patients. Why use standard precautions in healthcare settings? Because the pathogens are too small to be seen. People have an infection without showing or uh, manifesting the symptoms. People can spread the infection within a healthcare setting without knowing or showing the symptoms. So these are the components of standard precautions, hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, injection safety, disinfection and uh, sterilization of equipment, waste management, environmental cleaning, respiratory hygiene, and uh, cough etiquette. Now, improving the uh, infection prevention control landscape. There are five approaches. The first one, the first approach is preparation for action. And these steps ensure that all the prerequisites that need to be put in place for IPC success are addressed. And this includes human and financial resources, infection prevention and control infrastructures like uh, materials, uh, equipment for IPC, planning and coordination of activities, identification of roles and responsibilities, including the key opinion leaders and IPC champions. So the step requires a critical role and support of the facility senior managers, like the chief medical director and the chairman medical advisory committee. Uh, so the step two is a baseline assessment. And this involves conduct uh, uh, conducting an exploratory baseline assessment of current IPC situation, including identification of the existing strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats, which is critical for developing a tailor-made action plan that addresses the reality of a healthcare facility. And this can be done using the WHO IPC assessment uh, framework of the eight core components of IPC that uh, we uh, discussed earlier on. So additional IPC assessment tools, for example, the hand hygiene self-assessment uh, framework and observation-based tools could also be used. The step three is the developing and executing action plan. The results of the baseline assessment supports the development and execution of an action plan 
based around a multimodal improvement uh, strategy of build it, that's provision of the required uh, IPC needs, teach it by training and education of uh, the personnel on uh, infection prevention and control uh, program, check it by monitoring for adequacy, compliance, and then identifying gaps and then also feedback uh, provision. Sell it through advocacy so that it can be owned by every one of us and then leave it by behavioral and cultural changes towards IPC activities. The first step is accessing uh, impact by conducting a follow-up assessment using the same tools as in step two is crucial to determine the effectiveness of the plan. The focus is on impact, acceptability, and cost, uh, cost effectiveness. While the last but not the least is sustaining the program over a long time, and this is an important step in the cycle of improvement to develop an ongoing action plan and review schedule to develop the long-term impact and benefits of the IPC program, thus contributing to its overall impact and sustainability. So in conclusion, infection prevention and control is key to quality health care delivery and improving uh, the infection prevention and control landscape will lead to improvement in the quality of healthcare delivery. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, our erudite professor. Uh, there is a chat. Uh, there is somebody said something in the chat box uh, that we need to consider the legal framework for the IPC program to ensure implementation of. Um, I know he's, uh, he's very busy. We have taken a bit from his uh, schedule. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to ask one or two questions. You will see they are around, but we'll just take maybe one or two quickly and then you will listen to the next presentation. Uh, everybody is saying, wow, beautiful. Thank you very much, sir. So you can put up your hands. Uh, put up your hand if you want to. You just take one or two. Uh, one or two questions or comments. I've read the ones in the chat box. Uh, if there's any urgent one. Otherwise, we'll take the next presenter and take everything at the end so that we don't really uh, take uh, too long. You know, a specialist hospital is the best hospital for Lassa fever. Treatment of Lassa fever that is the outbreak. Uh, there is uh, it's endemic in Nigeria, and then we have to eradicate outbreak. Dr. Lowe, can you please? It's a question. It's a question here. It's a question. Yeah. Is it ideal to establish an IPC in a school? In a school. Thank yes. you. Okay. Yes, so that question is. Yes, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the IPC. Uh, it's everyone's business because the infection can spread from the community to the hospital. So that's what actually brings patients to the hospital. So um, it is in order to hire, have IPC uh, program established in the uh, school uh, premises. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll just take one more, one more, and then we will we will then continue the other questions till at the end, like we have on the agenda, so that I can quickly introduce the next speaker, so that we see the practical things. If you want, we wanted to share his wealth of experience uh, with us. Um, if you don't have, and then we should just move on. Our next. Um, we well, want to let Shikiade, uh, uh, the icon for person here, you have something to say? Yes, 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 bro. So, you, I hope your objective or the way for our people would like is to reduce healthcare citizen infection. 
So I'm wondering, like, as a public health person, so how do you situate yourself in high PC to make impact? Since healthcare has suited infections for me, suggestive so of only facility based programs. So, as a public, as in public health, how do we marry high PC and public health together? Um, uh, uh, the basic, uh, the main objective of uh, IPC is to control uh, or prevent uh, spread of uh, infections. And so, um, marrying public health and IPC. I think that's yes, the yes, yes. Yeah, uh, public health. It's a public health uh, issue. And so clinical microbiologists, infectious and diseases physician, and any physician that has interest in uh, public health and infectious diseases actually work together to ensure that uh, the program uh, succeeds. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It shows that IPC is teamwork. Uh, everybody has to come together and put all that is at stake together to ensure that we make success. Not only make success, we sustain it and we embed it into the health system. Uh, I think on that note, we want to go into experience sharing. And I want to introduce our next speaker, our next facilitator, Dr. Joan Edebi, who is a consultant clinical microbiologist um, from Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Uh, that's in the northwestern part of this country. We had uh, Professor Logo from the south south part of this country, and we are based in the southwest. So we are having Dr. JP. She's the infection prevention and control officer. She's the IPC focal person for Amadou Bello. Uh, in the university teaching also, which is a very, very massive teaching of the whole world. So Dr. Ejemi, John Ejemi, and she's an IPC enthusiast. She just finished all her courses. She's done a foundation intermediate and the advanced course. So back to you, Dr. John. You have the floor. Good afternoon, Ma. Good afternoon, uh, can, am I being heard? I've unmuted myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good afternoon, Ma. Good afternoon, Prof. Olu. All my teachers, seniors on the call. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, the admin. Well, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to share our experience from Abadu Beldo University. So if we can move to the next slide, we will see the outline that I intend to use for the presentation. We'll talk a brief about ABU, then how we can talk about how we can institute IPC at the points of um, service delivery. Then we'll look at some of the core components of um, IPC. Then, of course, challenges that we face at points of service delivery. And then I will conclude. So let's move. So now I'm at the Bello University Teaching Hospital, as my chief has said is located in the northwestern part of um, Nigeria. And it's a tertiary healthcare facility. So it has a lot of um, specialist services for patients. It's also a referral center for neighboring states and also facilities at secondary level within the state. It's a large facility. We have about 891 um, bed spaces and about 17 departments, both clinical and non-clinical departments. But you can see comparing the facility, we have a small IPC team, which consists of four doctors and six um, nurses. Two of our nurses just retired recently. So the number has gone down. And let me mention here that none of our staff is um, full-time IPC staff. We all have our primary responsibilities. IPC is part of our, uh, many other responsibilities that we do attend to. So now at the point of service delivery, I would like to reiterate something on IPC, which is what infection prevention and control means. IPC is what? A practical 
an evidence-based approach, which prevents patients and healthcare workers from being harmed by avoidable infection. The key words there are one, being practical. So as long as you have the knowledge and you do not put it into practice, then the whole purpose of IPC is defeated. Secondly, these practices are guided by evidence. Studies have been done, research has been done to prove that these practices work. So hand, IPC is not what? Hand hygiene. Everybody thinks IPC is hand hygiene. I'm very happy that Prof has elaborated on the many components of um, IPC and how it can be addressed. So what does it entail? As Prof mentioned, at the point of care, infection transmission should be interrupted. Wherever it is that point of care is taking place, whether it's at the clinic, whether it's at the ward, infection should be transmitted. He has mentioned the core components. Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Ma. Okay. So there are eight main components of um, IPC when it comes to implementation. So this we can find on the next slide. Prof has taken us through the various components. So I will not elaborate so much here. But I would like to share our experience on some of these components, education and learning on um, surveillance, um, the facility and the environment, and then monitoring and evaluation. So let's have the next slide. Now, education and training is one of the important aspects of um, establishing infection prevention and control programs. Why? Because it's a mode where you can achieve, a medium where you can achieve great impact. You improve knowledge, you share experiences, and then you get people to help to change behavior. So usually when we do trainings on IPC, we look at what are the main modes of transmission, which now brings us to standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. And one good thing about education and training is once you have the personnel, the resources that you need for training is um, minimal. I like to look at the years 2020 and 2021 as the year of IPC trainings. Globally, trainings are happening everywhere at facilities, everywhere possible because of the ongoing pandemic. At our own facility, we had trainings. We started with physical trainings to enable us to cover the whole hospital um, healthcare workforce. And then we had to change to virtual trainings to enable us keeping with the COVID-19 um, protocols. So let's move to the next slide. And of course, during trainings, you feel that you've achieved so much, you've passed on so much information and you're happy with yourself and the healthcare workers too are happy. But then when it now comes to assess how much of the knowledge that was passed on is actually being put to practice, you now have to do what assessments. So these are just some pictures. The next slide will show some pictures of what we found doing facility assessments after we had almost a whole year of training. If you look at this, of course, most of us can recognize the sharp boxes. You can see the picture to my left and the one to my right. The one to my left is what is over field. You will have some injection wrapping dropped on it. Then the one to my right, I think some body has gone to the extent of putting tea bags and has even soiled the container. So you can see how knowledge is passed, training has occurred, but when I come to access, how much of it is put in practice, you now find that there are gaps. And we know that whoever it is that puts in a syringe, and now feels resistance, it is that person's responsibility to shut the box so that nobody comes after you. That is what will avoid us having pictures like the one on my left. Please, let's have the next slide. So 
still on assessments regarding compliance. Prof has mentioned the tools that we use, hand hygiene compliance tool and the infection prevention control assessment framework. One assists, one assesses, the first one assesses how much healthcare workers comply at situations when they still perform hand hygiene. So after all these amenity trainings, hello, there's a lot of background um, noise. So after our many trainings, the IPC team carried out a hand hygiene compliance assessment, we went around the whole facility, and to our amazement, it was low. Now, bringing back this back to the point of training, during trainings, healthcare workers will tell you, during trainings, healthcare workers will tell you, I'm seeing a chat that there's no volume. Am I being heard? Yes, yes, you are being heard. Okay, so during training, healthcare you. workers are, are quick to complain, no water, no soap, no sanitizer. But interestingly, when we are conducting the observations, I know that water supply can be erratic sometimes, but at that point of assessment, we found out that the requirements, basic requirements were there. There was water, there was soap, there was alcohol-based sanitizer. So what was lacking was what? Attitude. So which brings to fall the point that healthcare workers are still yet to imbibe point of care risk assessment as a life-saving tool. You never know, Prof has mentioned, you never know which patient is infectious. So you must take precautions before you come in contact with the patient, the sample or whatever. And as long as this attitude persists, healthcare worker deaths will be the alert for outbreaks of Lassa fever. Please, can we have the next slide? So what were the lessons we learned from our assessments on the facility and on high hygiene compliance? Well, we found out that we were able to determine the gaps when it came to hand hygiene practice. And we realized that most healthcare workers miss moments one and five. And people usually miss performing hand hygiene as a result of using gloves. They feel that when they use gloves for an activity, once they take off the gloves, then they are good to go. No need to wash their hands, which of course is, is, is not right because anything could have come in contact with your hands even before you had the gloves on. So lesson learned here is that at our next training sessions, we will lay emphasis on these moments and why gloves should not continue to contribute to missed opportunities. Then important that we should integrate adult learning techniques. When you're dealing with adults and you need to change behavior, it's not, it's not uh, the way we treat undergraduates, should I say. We now incorporate observations like we are sharing now and pictures that we find during assessments into trainings because when people now see things coming from their own sections or their own units, then it's easier for them to realize whether it's wrong or right, and how it can lead to changing behavior, then we know that behavior is not an easy thing to change. But brainstorming with healthcare workers during trainings can help us arrive at solutions to enable behavioral change. Then very importantly, feedback and sharing results of assessments. During the work, facility walkthrough, we realized that unit heads are not happy when you are taking pictures of malpractice in their units. So they are prompted to improve. So giving feedback to them during departmental meetings and during training sessions is also a way where we can get people to adopt required behavior. Now I'll look at another component of um, IPC, which is the facility and the environment. The facility and the environment is very important because if it is not conducive, to IPC, then makes it more challenging for the healthcare worker to imbibe the practice. It has to be IPC compliant. For instance, does it have wash stations at the required points? Are the walls or the surfaces easy to clean so that you ensure that even after you've managed patients with infectious diseases, the, the environment can be cleaned regularly to reduce the chances of contamination and subsequent infection. 
So my hospital is an old one, but thank God, a lot of innovation is going on. And the new sections of the hospital, there are some changes which are making it easier to be IPC compliant. For instance, most of the older wards had um, knob taps that you had to turn on and turn off. But now we have the newer sections have elbow taps. There are more wash stations and the walls and surfaces are easy to clean. Then other issues that are not um, being well addressed should I say are the entry and exit points because handles should be avoided where possible. Maybe we'll go to the point where we can have automatic operated doors that will just open for you by sensor. So you need to touch the doors to get them to open. Because we realized during an assessment, a survey with hospital cleaners, we found out that places referred to as high touch surfaces, such as door handles, toilet handles, light switches, are hardly cleaned, even though they are high touch, which means a lot of people touch those surfaces. So those are nidoses for infection. So can we have the next slide? Now this slide shows us pictures of what our new ICU looks like. You can see from the beddings, you can see from the floors and from the walls, materials that are easy to clean, wipe clean, to ensure that the environment is more IC compliant and less likely to harbor infections. Can we have the next slide? The general outpatient clinic. Well, this was something that was a that, that raised a lot of discussion between the IPC team and the hospital management. For us here, the IGOPD is one of the busiest units. The place is usually like a marketplace. The place is usually crammed full. We gave suggestions to management on how to decongest. We talked about staggering appointments so that fewer patients come at a time. It was said not to be feasible. Then fortunately, management had the brainwave of uh, creating a sit out and shielding it from sun and other weather, other weather uh, events, so that this helps to decongest the GOPD. So now that makes that place more IPC compliant. So now let's see the next slide, which takes us to another important point surveillance for healthcare assisted infections. I'm so happy that Prof made a lot of emphasis when he talked about HAIs. Now, surveillance is an important link between IPC and other healthcare services, be it surgery, be it medicine, be it pediatrics. It's important why in developed clients, it's used as a requirement and an indicator for facility or patient safety. The board wants to know what is your rate of MRIC, what is your rate of surgical site infections, what is your rate of um, um, catheter associated urinary tract infections and all that. So this is a requirement in developed clients and gradually we are getting there. The point being that if you cannot market your skills, no matter how brilliant, no matter how fantastic the surgery you perform is. If you get sepsis at the end of it, it now becomes a minus. So it's dangerous when infection rates are unknown because then you don't even know where you are. And it's also dangerous when it's high, but when you know it's high, it's even better because then you cannot put interventions in place to ensure that you bring down the infection rates. In 2018, 2017, 2018, was when the team first planned setting up um, surveillance for HAIs in the facility but it crashed. At that point, we had a grant, but we couldn't execute it. Why? One, there was staff incorporation. This I feel was due to lack of understanding. Some people felt maybe you're trying to reach hunt. Some people feel, ah, why are you interested in what are the infection rates after my surgery? Or if I have a patient on admission, why are you interested in whether the person comes down with an infection? People feel it shows that there's a problem with the process, the procedures, or the level of care delivered. And which actually is true, but the important thing is that we should know so that we can address where the problems are. And I think one of the reasons why it also failed was that we had not done appropriate advocacy before trying to institute the healthcare surveillance. So we've learned from um, those mistakes. So the next slide will show us where we are now as regards healthcare assisted infections 
surveillance. So what we did, we developed our own tool and looking at the size of our facility and the number of people we have in the IPC team, we decided to phase it out so that will not be overstretched and in terms of human and then um, material resources. So the team decided to start with some high dependency units like the ICU, the SCBU, the bonds unit, and we decided to pick select health assisted infections, not all, surgical site infections and central line assisted bloodstream infections. Then we have developed the tool, we have undergone training on how to utilize the tool. One other thing we incorporated this time was to include people who work in the laboratory, lab scientists, and also a health information officer who will help with the data. Then letters to stakeholder departments. We've learned now that you just don't write letters. You sit down with the people and discuss, let them get an understanding of where, what the points they are coming from and how it's going to benefit them, the facility as a whole and improve patient and healthcare worker safety. So that has been done. What is left now is discussing with management on how funding for this surveillance is going to come out. So if we move to the next slide, an important aspect of IPC, which is sensitization. Um, CKRD mentioned something about the link between IPC and the community, isn't it? She feels, asking whether it was just a community thing or it only occurs in the hospital. One way where IPC links with the community is through sensitization. Sensitization might be planned or unplanned. Planned sensitization occurs like, like for instance, so we have IPC important days like the Global Hand Hygiene Day, which is May 5th. Sometimes it can be unplanned when you have outbreaks. I need to quickly intervene and educate the community, educate the hospital, healthcare workers, and other staff about what is ongoing and how they can protect themselves. So tradition is important when it's adapted to environment because um, if the people are giving the message to do not find culturally acceptable, then you make no headway. So the language and the content should be such that can inform the people and be acceptable by them. During, um, let me use the last, let me use the COVID uh, pandemic as an example. We had people who we, who we felt could influence behavior, role medals and members of the hospital management. We, we developed videos with them, which we now shared on social media platforms and the hospital social media handles around the hospital and globally, you know how social media usually just goes. And since our target were healthcare workers and hospital clients, also patients and visitors, we had to look for ways where we could also catch the patients and visitors part of our hospital population. So let's have the next slide. Now, we organized radio programs in addition to the videos that we had developed. I couldn't upload the videos because of the weight. This was a good medium to help us reach the surrounding hospital community. And we had radio programs on LASA, on COVID, on antimicrobial resistance, on hand hygiene to mention but a few. And we used both English and the local language so that we could carry the community along. And we tried to keep the content simple for clarity's sake. So if we move to the next slide, we have pictures of some IC materials we developed in English and the local language so that patients who also come to the hospital can understand, who are not um, conversant or literate in English can read in their local language. Now, I think this is the last major aspect I'm going to talk about, which is monitoring and evaluation. An IPC program cannot survive without M and E. My guy at the top has already mentioned it. M and E will tell you where you are, which is your baseline assessment, where you want to go. Do you want to reduce your infection rates from 80% to 10% or less than 10%? Then you now want to find out, are you making progress to achieve what your goal is? 
And this progress can only be tracked by monitoring and evaluation. The next slide shows us a picture of a Gantt chart, which we developed ending of last year as part of the activities in developing a HEI um, surveillance for developing the tool, for doing the training, and then for interacting with um, stakeholders. I may, did mention that all members of the team are not full-time IPC staff. We all have primary responsibilities elsewhere. So without an activity checker and without planning, there is no how we can keep up to track with your requirements when it comes to instituting an IPC program. So it is pivotal to success. So for your program to succeed, this is one of the main things you need to address. Now, what are our challenges when it comes to IPC at the healthcare facility? I usually like to say IPC is an orphan. IPC has the characteristics or features of an orphan. When you need money for something, you are usually, uh, yeah, you usually seconded for something that people feel is more important because why resources are scarce and people cannot really say what is IPC doing. They feel that with probably with just talk, you can achieve your goal or your purpose, but that is not feasible as the earlier presentation has shown us. And because progress seems to be slow, it usually takes time to convince people to come on board and then commit the resources that's required for you to achieve the required goals. When things go wrong, you get blamed for it. A healthcare worker comes down with LASA and then all the fingers are pointing at the IPC committee. They didn't do this, they didn't do that. Forgetting that there are many aspects to IPC and in a large extent, it also comes down to the healthcare workers attitude. Of course, just like the orphan, appreciation is hard to come by. And if you cannot motivate yourself because of the challenges that you meet on a daily basis, then it's difficult. I have mentioned the lack of dedicated staff. We have an 891 bed facility. Ideally, you should have one full-time IPC professional to 250 beds. That is full-time. But here, we do not have any staff that is full-time IPC staff. And our time is usually distributed between myriad of activities. So keeping focus to achieve your goal is also a challenge. One very important challenge is speaking truth to power. Interacting with hospital management can be challenging when you're trying to convince them about changes they need to make in the facility, in the environment, to make it more IPC compliant or when it comes to the issues of supplies. It happened a lot during the COVID um, pandemic, even during the Lassa fever epidemic we had last year and this year. Hospital management was magnanimous enough to foot the first batch of supplies we had. They gave us money to purchase the supplies before we started getting supplies from NCDC. So this was an important stopgap to help us address the challenge at that time. But it's not all the time you find somebody in management that is willing to listen to you. So I'm happy to appreciate our current management for giving us their ears. Now, I would like to conclude by saying that instituting IPC at a facility is an uphill task. We are running uphill against many contentions, many obstacles. And you need regular assessments to monitor your progress. No matter how slow it is, just make progress so that you move from where you are and you get closer to achieving your goal. You may lose some, you may win some, but at least you live to improve IPC another day. So thank you all for your time. So my last slide says, thank you from oh. all of us here in Zaria. Oh, nice having you. That was a brilliant one. There is so many people saying well done to you. Maybe you are know you've been at it, but let us know now our comments and questions in the chat box. Let's switch in from the last presenter, Dr. Yabo Daya. She is a consultant pediatrician, pediatric physician. Well, we have said it, infection uh, uh, prevention and control. It is all stakeholders. Everybody has something at stake. 
She's the Chief Executive Officer of Lifeline Children Hospital, Sunuleri. She, of course, she's a uh, source of specialty is uh, pediatric endocrinology, but then she has very, very passionate about IPC. And she's gone through the basic course and the intermediate course. And she's one of our very, very strong and um, strong advocates for IPC. So she wants to talk to us about what the spotlights, what she's been able to do with the training she got at the College of Mercy University of Lagos in Diaraba with Lifeline Children Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Iyabo. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I'm just trying to put this on slideshow. Good afternoon. Uh -oh, sorry, this is blocking my slideshow. <laughs> can you hear? You can hear me. Yes, yes, you can. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, I'm just trying to put my yeah. slides on slideshow. But while I'm trying to do that, um, okay, it is on slideshow. Thank you. No, it's not on slideshow. Sorry, there's just something blocking my slideshow. But anyway, I can um, I can continue while I'm trying to put it on slideshow. So good afternoon. My name is. Uh, Dr. Kodaya, and um, I work at Lifeline Children's Hospital. Okay, Lifeline Children's Hospital is a private uh, healthcare, uh, pediatric healthcare center, and we've been in operation for close to 30 years. I um, did my first IPC, the basic IPC course in 2018. And I must say it has made a huge difference to me personally and to our practice. And I was fortunate to do the uh, intermediate course this year. Thank you. I'd just like to share a few things that we've managed to do at Lifeline. Um, since I, I did the training with uh, the summary of the things we've been able to do, we've been able to set up an IPC team. Uh, we've been able to improve the standard, uh, improve on our standard precautions, and we have regular trainings on standard precautions. We've had training on hand hygiene, and I'll just go through one or two high highlights on this. We've had training on injection safety, and we had a recent training on injection safety, because while we were monitoring, um, while a member of our IPC team was monitoring at one of the hospitals, we uh, took a few pictures of um, uh, some, a sharp box that was uh, too full. And uh, we also saw a needle you know, on the floor in our laboratory. So immediately we got to work and trained all the healthcare workers, including the janitors. We've done a few things on waste disposal since uh, we, I did the course. We've rebuilt our waste disposal, um, the outside waste disposal, and we've labeled them properly into um, uh, shops, uh, domestic waste and medical waste. So we've re rebuilt that at both sites. We operate from two sites, one in Surulere, one in Lekki. Um, cleaning and disinfection, um, I'll go through that. PPE, uh, I'll go through that. We've also had regular training on hand hygiene. We have this before all clinical meetings and also we've um, included it as part of our staff orientation of new staff. We have posters on how to hand drop and a guide to proper hand washing, as well as the five moments of hand hygiene. And we have those at every hand hygiene station. We also printed some stickers for the hospital, LCH is Lifeline Children's Hospital. 
And those stickers, I think I have a little picture of one of them says, each sticker is a little round sticker saying, save lives, wash your hands. And uh, on our hand hygiene program, we've tried to do monitoring of the hand hygiene using the WHO tool for hand hygiene um, and that we have adapted you know, for Lifeline Children's uh, Hospital. Okay. Um, so um, the first thing was, you know, we set up our IPC practices. We had to set up an IPC team. I am the lead for the IPC team, but we also have uh, four other people on the IPC team, two of whom we've sent for some external training on um, IPC and who we hope will do the um, IPC program at uh, CCAPS. But they do have some IPC training and uh, we have set up an IPC uh, uh, team. And we've had that now since uh, just, I think since 2018, when I did the, the, the course on IPC. All right. And again, on our injection safety, I'll, I'll go through some photos after this. On our injection safety, um, we have sharp boxes at every point of care. We train on the use of sharp boxes, what to put in. They shouldn't be more than two thirds full, how to close and dispose of it, and how to assemble the um, sharp boxes. Then, of course, we monitor, we monitor and we retrain. And uh, we retrain again using um, the multimodal strategies. We've also trained on bloodborne infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and um, what to do if you have a needle stick injury, which we hope we will not have if we do um, our IPC properly. So maybe I'll just talk to the pictures and then discuss a few things. Now, this is one of our hand hygiene uh, stations, this picture. It's, so we have this at every hand hygiene station. So you can see that we have how to hand wash, how to hand rub, and the five moments of hand hygiene. And as we said, we go around regularly. A member of the IPC team goes around regularly. In fact, like on a daily basis, just observing, and if people aren't doing it correctly, we we correct them and the issue that we have found is not that people don't do hand hygiene they do it but they don't do it correctly so they may either not do it for long enough or they sometimes don't always do it at the five moments particularly when it comes to doing hand hygiene after you know you've touched things in your environment so and we use uh, paper towels and and one of the most important things we also you know try to let them know as we're using the multimodal strategies is the issue of you must not shut when you're shutting the sink you must not use your the hands you've just hygiene you know you've just washed or whatever to close the tap. So we 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 have um, hand uh, paper paper roll or hand uh, paper just beside each hand hygiene. Again, this is another hand hygiene um, station. It's a bit small. You cannot see it properly, but it's got everything, and you can see the two bins. One for the medical which is lined with yellow, that's the one on the left, and the one for the you know, non-medical or domestic staff. So this is also another consortium area. Um, we, um, for our hypochlorite solution, we designed this, um, how to make 0.5% sodium hypochlorite and how to make 0.05% hypochlorite, which is the bleach. And this, usually it is our janitors, we've trained them. They're the ones that make this solution in the morning. And then 
it is distributed to the various uh, stations and they also have it and they know what to use for what so if we're just cleaning the beds or cleaning a room they know what to use and it's all you know so this was what we designed but the what i really want to show is you know here is how you know it's it's pictorial so it's easy for them and they are supervised by uh, one of the ipc team members now before the um i did the basic ipc course we've always had a laundry but as soon as i did the course in fact the the day after we went to the laundry at loose and they took us round i immediately went back and i said you know what our laundry is tiny it's tiny because we are we're not in a purpose uh, built um, building so even though our laundry is tiny we said we've got to have the flow the flow from sorting sorry i'm i'm not sure that was included but anyway we we have the flow we start with sorting then after sorting uh, washing i think this is a uh, uh, no this is a dryer we have a washing machine before this then we have the dryer and it's all labeled i don't know if you can see it right on top this is the dryer you can see drying on top of the wall and then after that we have um ironing and that's labeled too that wasn't put in this slide and then we have a container for the clean uh, fabrics i mean if, uh, what has been washed and also what one of the pictures i had put on before was uh, our laundry man in his ppe he knows what ppe to wear when he's going onto the wards to collect because we don't have the luxury of having uh, people in the laundry people who go to collect separately so he wears his ppe he wears his apron he wears his uh, shoes and his gloves to go and collect and he takes his leak proof yellow bag when he's going to collect the laundry which the nurses also would have put in a leak proof bag and then the last thing you know where the clean linen is you can see in there now waste disposal uh we 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 built this we we just did this immediately after the training where we have uh, we bought different uh, bins and we constructed three different areas one for domestic waste you can see this middle one is for shops and the the last one is for the medical waste and they are labeled they are labeled you know shops and the ones for medical waste are labeled and so that when the uh, medical waste people come to collect they know what to collect and anyway there's also an ipc a member of the ipc team there when they come to collect on top of it, you can see that we have some color coded mops and uh, things uh, that we use. We're just drying them, you know, on, on here on top of it after they've been used and uh, washed. Um, now, for our waste disposal, we have cleaned all staff and all our janitors. We also have a, a job aid for them. And we've taught them on segregation of waste at the point, you know, that uh, at the point that the waste is produced, so at the point of production of waste, and uh, we have our. Right, I feel like I will seem to be losing you. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear you now. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, um, for our waste disposal. And um, I said we've trained all our staff, all the clinical staff, and also the janitors. Actually, we've trained everybody in the hospital on, on waste disposal. And uh, also on the segregation of waste. We have dustbins in all clinical areas. We have two types of dustbins, you know, and all our dustbins are lined. The non-medical, you know, the, the black, 
then in the infectious waste is lined yellow. In the theater and in some other areas, we have the red bins as well, the ones that are lined with uh, red. So waste disposal at point of production, we've trained on that. Then there's a, a, we, we monitor daily to make sure that um, our bins, the dust bins, are, the pedals are functioning properly, that they are lined with the correct um, colored liners and that they are not overfilled. And they are collected by our janitors who wear the appropriate PPE, they wear their utility gloves, they take their leak proof liners, so the black, the yellow, the red in theater. And um, then we have, the, this, of course, the disposal of waste. So this is the outside uh, disposal of waste where we constructed a waste house. We have another waste house, which is uh, even nicer than this on the other side. And again, it's, you know, um, we've separated it into domestic infectious waste and sharp waste, and it's labeled. Um, we also had to procure more drums and we made sure that we make sure that the covers are never open and our waste collection for the domestic waste, it, it, that gets full rather quickly. It's collected by Loma and um, the infectious waste is also collected by another type of Loma and they, they do that and then the shops too. So. Okay, then on cleaning and disinfection, we've done a lot on that too. We've trained janitors, cleaning and disinfection, the color coding. We have color coded mop sticks, mop pockets, and dance. So, uh, so uh, green, yellow, red. We have the uh, utility caddy carriers for cleaning agents, and I've talked also uh, previously about the how the hypochlorite and that is outside where the janitors are we also have that um, you know that inside in various strategic um, areas and even ambulance cleaning we've trained on how to clean the ambulance what you use for the front of the ambulance what we use for the inside of the ambulance and all that, and we ha we have somebody in charge of that. And I think I've talked about uh, linen already, and um, also the nurses have been trained on linen handling. Okay, I think this is our waste disposal in the at the Surulere site. You can see that we have this is for you can see it's labeled non medical waste bin here, but there are other parts of it for medical and for shop, and they are separated. Um, we also, this is our little sticker that we designed ourselves, um, you know, so learn more on our website. And we said, save lives, wash your hands. So use alcohol, you know, hand drop. At a time, you know, we are not doing it so much now, but we used to even stick this on the school bag children who need to see, see us, some of our children, you know, a lot of the children whose mothers would bring them would stick this sticker on, on their bags so that the moms, the parents too would um, remember. And then we also have this um, in various areas in the, in the hospital. So uh, on cleaning too, of course, we had to train on how do you clean uh, blood or, or, or vomit, vomitus. How do you clean spills? We had to train um, on that, you know, that you don't just pour your hypochlorite on it directly. You know, what do you, you know, what to do? So we had to train on that. This is a picture of our, I think one of our matrons. Well, anyway, two of our nurses uh, making a, a bed in one of the rooms. And as you can see, they've got on their PPE, they've their apron, their uh, mask. Um, okay, so I think I've shown you this before. And this is just one of the tasks for the janitors, is just to show 
you know, what they must do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, what they must clean. This is a consulting room. You can see that um, I think, okay, they use an EMR, hence the computer on each table. And uh, one of the things we've tried to stress too is that even the computer is part of the patient's environment. So that hand hygiene must be done even after you've touched your computer because the patient can come in, cough, sneeze, droplets may land on your computer. So uh, you can see that on the tables, we, I think we've got our hand hygiene, uh, we've, we've got our alcohol hand rub and on the, there's a sink behind this. We've got everything, then the couch, we, we, we have our, um, our couch rolls, you know, on the, on the couch. So, okay, yeah, that's our alcohol hand drop as well. Now, have we had any issues? Because it's not all, yes, we, have we had any issues with IPC? We continue to monitor. At one time, our hand hygiene compliance, we do do hand hygiene compliance using the, you know, WHO tool. There was a time that our hand hygiene compliance fell, and it even it even fell to like forty six percent. I think prior to that we had been getting like 67, 70 percent, and then it fell. So we started looking in what what is it that is making our hand hygiene compliance fall, and we started making sure that look we are using the multimodal strategies, and then we then found out like with most, a lot of hospitals, a lot of medical personnel, they come, they don't stay with you for too long or you know, they are applying to go out of the country. So um, I think we, we found out that there was a bit of a high turnover of staff. So we then decided that we must strengthen, you know, uh, hand hygiene for new staff. So we were focusing on all staff, but more so on, um, on uh, new staff. So what lessons have um, we learned? I, I told you also that um, we do a lot of education and training. We have clinical meetings every, we try to have it every week, but sometimes it's every two weeks. We have clinical meetings on various topics. But before the clinical meetings, we always do our hand hygiene um, training. Now we tend to have our clinical meetings online via Zoom, but we still do the hand hygiene training and we ask questions. We don't just demonstrate, we ask questions. When shouldn't you do? Okay, tell us the difference between hand hygiene and hand wash. Oh, how many you know, seconds should you do this for? How many, which one is better you know, for and, and when? Um, what if your hands, when shouldn't you do, um, shouldn't you use alcohol hand drop, you know, and we wait for the answer when your hands are visibly soiled and things like that. So, so could I, also, yes. In a brilliant I almost, presentation, I wish we can have this all before it's already, it's already, it's in. Okay, I've almost finished. Yeah, I've almost ready. finished, thank you. Thank so you. we've done IPC in Lassa fever. You know, we recently did a training on IPC. We talked about Lassa fever. Then I talked about IPC in Lassa fever mode of transmission first, contact and droplet, then hand hygiene, what PPE should be used, the case definition, et cetera, et cetera. So we have had problems, you know, trying to institute our IPC, but it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing lesson for all of us. So I think I'd really like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, here and just to showcase a few of the things we've um, managed to do and that we are continuing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. That was really beautiful. And uh, for you to have done this much, I'm sure a lot of our participants are learning quite a lot that you don't win it all. You win some, you lose some, but then you don't give up. When you fall, you pick it up again and look for the reason why and then forge your head. Uh, that was a brilliant presentation. We had 
three beautiful presentations today on interwoven to strengthen our uh, infection prevention and control. So do we have any comments? There are a lot of comments in the chat box. They are all positive, uh, saying that uh, brilliant, but there is one. Um, by this is the challenge, it's almost the same. This is the challenge, since the challenges are almost the same, how can governments be communicated to help out in the area of financing and improved personnel for improved IPC? When government intervention, does anybody want to take that? Professor uh, Olobo just have to step up. Well, I'm sure he's listening because he said he will still be on um, the Zoom. Uh, but if you can take all the questions here, we will uh, communicate. Government, for me, is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. Well, we have a lot of change agents here. Uh, we are all doing our own little role in our own little pockets. But one day we'll get there. But that's one big challenge. But I'm sure we'll make it. Uh, there was something in the papers about the lawmakers asking the medical directors to come and you know, explain to them why they're not doing some things. So we should keep pushing. And I'm sure we have some representatives from the National Center for Disease Control. But we should keep pushing. Don't let us give up. We will not give up. We will keep pushing. Yes, Dr. Vanusi from Canada. We have that's nice. Oh, from US. Oh, that's good. Good. We have US, we have Canada, we have even within Nigeria, we have from all the states. It's so nice seeing the cross section. Can you just say a word or two? I don't want to do all the topics. Does anybody want to say something? Just put up your hand and um, please say, oh, that's good, great. Can you have a word or two from you, please? Word of encouragement that we shouldn't give up. <laughs> we are not going to give up. We are going to keep pushing. Any comments? And I know Anna is on. I know she's on from Cape Town. Yes, I want to say thank you very much. Before the others, it was great listening to all of you and keep the good work going. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, we need all the encouragement. It's, it doesn't mean easy. You, 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 you have good plans, but then, you know, it's not all win, win, win. We lose some, but we will not give up. We will get there. Any other comments? Somebody asked for the presentations we are going to organize and share with you, uh, whatever we have. Uh, all the presentations are with us, we will share so that we continue to push wherever we are. The little lessons we've learned, we are ready to share it, to make IPC better in Africa, not just in Nigeria, in Africa. That's our goal. And thank you, Echo India. Anybody wants to just say a word or two before we. Hello? Timran, are you still there? Yes, Dr. Swande, it was a great session and I really appreciate your efforts. So thank you everyone for joining in. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other person? Well, we need your feedback. Please give us your feedback so that we can make it better and better still. Please, thank you. Thank you, okay. Well, uh, the chat box is, uh, is so, your feedback is very, very, very necessary for us to make this uh, sessions better. Uh, like I said earlier on, sorry, we wanted to take on the epidemiology last month, but it didn't work out, but we still try to see what we can do to make it back. Um, but next month, by the, well, and then before I go to next month, 
This period is very, very important. This week is actually African Immunization Week. And I hope all of us, the IPC enthusiasts, are doing something to promote immunization for preventable uh, infection, infections that we have, especially in Africa. And the Monday was Global Malaria Day. I hope we all did something. And next week, May 5th, is Global Hand Washing Day. And I hope I just want to remind us that we should remember that we should keep pushing, keep pushing, and we'll get there. Next month, we are hoping to take on water, sanitation, and hygiene. And we are working to bring you elder speakers that we went to appetite to ensure that we make this IPC better. Dr. Adenike, I did work on, I can see you, thank you. But I can't mention everybody's name, but I know there are so many of you here. We appreciate your yeah, Hello, good afternoon. good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. I know you are into quality oh, no. control. You want to hear that? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. So, I don't know, thanks to presenters. Uh, let's keep up the good work. We are all working, working, working. We are banging our head and we are going to win. We are going to keep banging our head no matter what. We will keep knocking, knocking, knocking until the door is open. And the door will be open. It will definitely open. So if there is no more comments or questions, I think I would want to just say thank you all very much. We really appreciate your joining this session. And uh, we hope we continue to continue with Echo India. Thank you very much, Echo India. Thank you, Icon. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Everybody from all the continents for supporting Africa, we will get there. We will definitely get there. Thank you and God bless. Um, um, somebody say something from South Africa before I close finally. Thank you for the presentations and the organizers. Even in South Africa, we were a bit not understanding the start sign, and that are different. That is not different from yours in Nigeria. Next time we will know. That I know in Africa we are all the same. Starting off may be difficult. Uh, John Ejebi has said these are not big tasks, but we will not relent. We will get to the peak of the hill by space. Thank you all. Thanks and God bless you. Okay, uh, thank you. I don't know, Anna, you have your hands up. You want to say something? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody, like Dr. Zawanda said about the hand hygiene next week, please, we need your pictures um, of the activities that you are doing to celebrate hand hygiene. Send it to NSIC and also to ICANN. We want to put, post it onto our website to show the world that Africa is really there on um, promoting hand hygiene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. So we should all start thinking about it and then make this year better than even last year. So we pledge our support. It begins with each and every one of us. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon.